Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, Interim Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. With me today is Dr. Bill Maurice, the President and CEO of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. Hi, Bill. Welcome back. Yeah. Hi, Bobby. You've been Good traveling to be back. quite a bit, right? Yes. Yeah, I've been traveling, and this time again, out of the country. So I've been traveling for quite a bit in the country. I, uh, I think we talked about I was in Washington, D.C. for the American mm -hmm. Clinical Laboratory Association uh, annual meeting. and and uh, But now I was just in Brazil uh, visiting some labs and some hospitals and things down there. Uh, opens your eyes into what's going on in the world. I know we've you've been talking with Dr. Binnaker about measles and measles outbreak in Europe and now in the U.S. Um, there, I was surprised the hospitals are dealing with a surge in dengue virus cases to the point where they're having yeah. capacity issues in the hospitals because there's so many patients with dengue fever. And it's just something that we don't think a lot about. But, it, you know, again, it makes you, first of all, it makes you realize that these things continue to plague us around the world, number one, and really put stresses on the healthcare system. And number two, you know, something we'll want to keep an eye out for here because, you know, in terms of we don't think about that as being in the northern North America, but it's, I guess it's possible that we could be dealing with that here this summer. Yeah, it is, Bill. And definitely we have the mosquitoes that transmit dengue virus. So I'm glad you brought that up. We have had locally acquired cases, but mostly through mosquito control, we were able to eliminate uh, any disease areas within the U.S., but it's always a risk. And now uh, the CDC actually just issued a level one warning for American travelers going to many different countries in Latin America, specifically for dengue. Yeah. So you're right. It, it really raises the awareness of what other countries are dealing with. And the fact that the hospitals were just very crowded and busy with cases, um, I think just shows that this is a very serious disease. They actually have had 549 cases so far in Puerto Rico, and more than 340 were hospitalized. And that's just wow. Puerto Rico. So it yeah. can be serious, even deadly infection. Yeah, no, I maybe think I wish I would have uh, yeah, plugged your other, their ABCs. I should have, I didn't have my mosquito repellent with me when oh. I went down there. Luckily, I, was, I wasn't outside, so that was fine, but... Uh, yeah, and then things continue to happen here as well. I know that there was uh, last month there was a, a couple of our articles in a new in a single edition of New England Journal, which caught a lot of people's attention around cancer screening. Yeah, let's transition to that. This will be a great topic because we're really covering the out updates and what's going on in laboratory medicine and pathology. So those articles were quite interesting. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about them? They all have to do with colon cancer screening. Yeah, that's right. There were two. One, I think, was from uh, Garden Health, which mm -hmm. published their, you know, has been working on a blood born, a blood based, excuse me, not blood born, blood based testing <laughs> of cell free DNA to, for can colon cancer screening. Uh, and then Exact Sciences, actually, also in that same edition, had uh, an article that for the clinical trial for their new, they have a new version, I think, of their Cologuard stool based screening test. Um, both caught a lot of attention. Uh, because the, the exact sciences is even more accurate and sensitive and specific than their existing test. And then, of course, Garden didn't perform quite as well, I don't think, in terms of, you know, you might know the numbers better than me, but not quite as well, but still detected a significant number of cases. And, and so it's, it's, uh, it, they're both really important studies, I think. I agree. Cancer screening is very important, and this is specifically for colon cancer. And I'm sure everyone that's listening knows the conventional way is you'd get a colonoscopy, you'd have to take time off to work, you'd have to drink all that liquid, which was a strong laxative and not a fun experience for anyone who's done it. And so anything that's going to make it easier for people to get screened is a good thing. And we also know that cancer rates are going up across the country, especially among young people, which is quite Quite interesting. So colon cancer is one of those cancers. It's obviously an important cancer. I was really interested in the cell-free DNA detect, uh, technology to detect colon cancer because it's just a blood draw. Um, but you're right. It only detected about 80% of the colorectal cancer cases, and it didn't do very well in detecting those precancerous lesions that you really would want to detect and remove before they get to cancer. 
But regardless, it's a very promising technology that you can detect circulating tumor DNA circulating in the bloodstream. Yeah, and, and well, to your point, I mean, I, I've, I've not delved into this, and it might be another interesting thing for us to talk about, but it, there's been a lot of many, I've seen from many sources that there, that the incidence of cancer is rising, particularly in patients under 50, maybe even under, you know, in the young, but I now, I guess, in my age, kind of early, mm -hmm. earlier in adulthood, I guess, is the best way to put it. And, and one of the reasons that you could say, why such a focus on colon cancer um, screening? And I think that's really uh, twofold. Number one, um, we know that screening is effective and can detect, early detection of colon cancer is key in terms of if you get it at an early stage, the outcomes tend to be very, very good, right? And number two, it's one that because of the, what you described, people just are not very compliant with screening. I remember when, because, you know, Cologuard and Exact Sciences was actually, the the, the intellectual uh, content of that test was actually developed at Mayo Clinic by Dr. David, the late Dr. David Alquist, great guy. Um, and so, and, it, you know, he's a, he was a gastroenterologist. And of course, a lot of the people in his profession were like, well, wait a second, you know, we do endoscopies are good. They're they're an important part of our practice. If we do this, will patients not get as much endoscopy? And it really has not an impact because the reality is that I don't remember the, the the precise numbers, but pretty low compliance with cancer screening by by colonoscopy. So that's why there's such a focus on this. If we can find more convenient ways for patients to screen, we can really make a major impact in terms of um, detecting cancer before uh, before it spread. Uh, and I, I, many of us, and myself included, have had uh, no have personal experience with people who have passed away pretty early in life with colon cancer. So I think it's important. Um, interestingly, as part of that day, the debate there too is, um, I, I, I believe last year there was a push to get uh, a congressional bill passed to for to ensure that patients these tests were covered, you know, by by payers, and that did not pass. So there's still a lot of the science is advancing. Um, and the rationale to make it more available, but it's still going to have the same kind of, you know, regulatory and and payment sort of hurdles that we that we, you and I have talked about a lot. You had to think about all of it, right? Yeah, there's this issue of insurers paying for screening, which we would think is such an important aspect, so much easier and better to detect cancer before it occurs or spreads, but then also these new tests specifically not being covered. And some of these new methodologies like cell-free DNA that can cost upwards of $1,000, and then will it be covered by insurance? So on one hand, you have a technology like a simple blood draw detecting cell-free DNA or testing of stool, which may be easier and people may find it more acceptable and actually get screened. But then on the other hand, you have the fact that the cost of the tests may not yet be covered. So I think we're going to see this evolve over time, especially as these tests get better and better and are preferred over patients compared to the routine screening methods. Yeah, and I think it's also, I, I agree. And, you know, how can we help? I, I think in the laboratory, again, we tend to think a lot about validating tests and, you know, and making sure that they work, which is entirely appropriate and what we should be doing. But at the same time, we also have to think about the value that our tests create for patients and making sure that value is seen. Because on the one hand, yes, that, that you know, the new tests are more expensive than, than some of, you know, than like the, some of the traditional colon cancer screening tests, which are, you know, hemoglobin and, and stuff like that, which aren't very accurate. Flip side is, there's first of all the human impact, which is most important, and you know, make preventing someone from having a failable disease. But then also the healthcare costs, right? So if you start to say, if you think about the fact that if you catch more of these cases early, how much cost are we keeping out of the healthcare system? So yeah, a thousand dollars sounds like a lot for tests, but when you think about the tens of thousands of dollars and the human impact of someone oh, being yeah. diagnosed with late stage cancer, then all of a sudden the test doesn't look so expensive, right? So it's kind of how do we make that argument? again, to payers, whether it's in the government and policy or with private payers, both. I think that's something we're going to have to continue to focus on as laboratorians, because we continue to push the science. We have to understand how the science is creating value for patients and be the voice of that. Because I can tell you, I, I've had conversations with, uh, you know, with people, and I'm sure you have too through your role in CAP, mm -hmm. mine through like with Ac American ACLA and others. It's, you know, that's not clear, even to physicians that are in positions of making policy, how a test really links to value and how innovation in tests can really create values for healthcare and for patients. And so I think we have to continue 
to make sure that we make that point. Yeah, we're part of the full ecosystem. We have to make sure that we're helping our patients and that we're working as part of the team, including the physicians that are going to be ordering these tests, educating them and making sure that our tests are adding value. Because we could also just get caught up in making improvements, which could lead to more expensive tests and perhaps don't have the human impact we would want. Exactly. Yeah, but I think I think I think it's harder. I think it's harder for because I I haven't been in those guys, but you know, radiology, they're always introducing new machines that are more sensitive and pick up more things. And, you know, it, it, I think for some reason, it's just a little bit, we just have to help pe create that context for people with labs. And even mm -hmm. coming off of COVID where we thought a lot of this would become more part of the common vernacular, it really hasn't. So, so, so we've still got work to do. Yep. We'll keep talking about these important new advances. Yep. But it's exciting stuff. I mean, the reality is helping to screen patients for cancer in ways that are more convenient and can really help them is it, it, it's a very exciting, important development, I think. Well, thanks again for a great discussion, Bill. I look forward to talking to you next week. Yes, yes. And let's we'll, we'll keep talking and we'll have to do a reminder in those ABCs, particularly if I go back to Latin America to make sure I don't get dengue fever because it doesn't yes, sound like Yes, the ABCs of, of tick and mosquito-borne prevention. Why don't we just end with that? So avoiding yeah. areas where ticks and mosquitoes can be, wearing a bug repellent, and covering up to prevent skin from getting exposed to areas where mosquitoes and ticks can bite. Yep, so yes, so don't forget your ABCs. Yeah, I actually forget. travel with little uh, single-use insect repellent wipes, which you can yes. get on at your local grocery store and other places. So there you I go. Didn't. Safe didn't travel for your next place. But next <laughs> time I will. It has to be part of my travel kit. So That's right. All right, Val. Talk to you later. Yeah, it's always great catching up. Thanks. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday. <laughs>